Hey everyone, it's Kelly Alabozic. Um, hope everyone's hanging in there. You're almost done. Um, this is your Im immune um, voiceover. Um, so let's get started. Um, readings for this content would be chapter 13 goes over hypersensitivity reactions and chapter 64 goes over lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, both in Lewis. All right, so let's get started. Hypersensitivity reactions. These are really um, allergic reactions to your body. It's your body reacting against itself. So we're gonna find out why this happens. Um, so hypersensitivity reactions is the beauty's body's immune response that can overreact against foreign antigens. So something that the body's not really used to. Typically we are predisposed to things, so our body does get a sense of what that antigen is. But when that antigen comes around a second time, um, that's when we can develop that overreaction. So for example, um, we get that pollen, that first you know, um, sensitivity, sensitivity of pollen. We don't get that allergic reaction right away, but the next time we do get sensitized to that pollen, that's when we can develop that early allergic reaction. And that's very typical for hypersensitivity reactions. Um, other examples of foreign antigens, it can be chemotherapy, any type of viruses, really any type of medication, bacteria, proteins in our food, blood transfusions, especially if it's the incompatible type of blood, um, and snake venom, um, bee stings. Um, just an example from what I happened to me, um, and I forgot to go over this in class, but when I was little, I was about four years old, and um, I got salmonella food poisoning from a cheeseburger. And usually, typically, you know, you can fight salmonella food poisoning. Our bodies try to fight it off. It's, it's a bacterial infection, and we just fight through it. But for me, um, my neutrophils actually attacked the salmonella in my body, um, and also my eosinophils. So those are both blood types of um, blood cells, my neutrophils and my eosinophils. And because it reacted in that way, I was sick for over two years. Um, no one could really find out what was going on with me until I went to Boston Children's Hospital and they did a lot more tests on me and figured out I was, um, my body was kind of attacking itself with the salmonella. So they finally found a medication for my body to fight that off. Um, so just an example of a foreign antigen for me was salmonella food poisoning. Um, the body can react against its own tissue, which can cause tissue damage and really inflammation. And that's what's going a lot going on with a lot of these allergies and antigens is our body's creating a type of inflammatory response. Autoimmune disease is an example of a hypersensitivity reaction. And typically that's what's going on is it's autoimmune and our body's fighting against it. Um, and what happens is the body does not recognize itself proteins and it reacts against itself. So there's four different classifications of hypersensitivity reactions. Um, we're going to go over these. Um, really what I do want you to know is the antigens that cause that what causes the antigen in each type of classification and the example of the symptoms. Okay, I know we're going to go about mediators of injury. We're going to learn about the cells and whatnot. Um, I really don't want you to know too, too much about the cells. I just care about that you know the antigens and the symptoms that go along with that, okay? Um, we can classify hypersensitivity reactions by the source of the antigen as well as the timing of the sequence. So we're going to go through this. Um, so type 1, also known as medicated. The antigens, for example, are pollen, food, drugs, and dust. Um, the big example for this type of classification is anaphylaxis, and we're gonna get to that in a little bit. The rate of development for this classification is immediate. The cells that go along with this type of injury are histamines, mast cells, leukotrienes, and prostaglandins. And the symptoms that can occur are allergic rhinitis. You know, you get the puffy eyes, the runny nose, um, the itchy eyes. You get a little asthma, dermatitis to the skin, angioedema, um, and also types of symptoms of what would be known as anaphylaxis. 
Um, there can be a skin test for this known as the wheel and flare. Moving on to classification number two, also known as cytotoxic. Um, these antigens are mainly red blood cells and cell basement membranes. The big one for this cytotoxic classification is actually blood transfusion reactions, especially if there's an incompatible donor. Um, the rate of development for this is minutes to hours. And the mediators of injury, um, also known as the cells having to do with this, is complement lysis in the macrophages. The symptoms that go along with this classification are hemolytic transfusion reactions, um, good pasture syndrome, which is actually known as antibodies that affect the lungs and the kidneys, um, thrombocytopenia, and Graves' disease, which is um, thyroid overproducing hormones. The um, no skin test for this classification. This is just a YouTube video. Um, we watched it in class. I think you guys will like it. And like I said, just concentrate on the antibodies that are involved in the classification and the symptoms that go along with it, okay? They do a really good job with the recap part of this video. Um, so I would really just pay attention to the recap part. Um, that's actually in the middle towards the end of the video. And, um, Finishing up with these classifications, there's type three, which is immune complex. The antigens with this can be fungal, viral, and bacterial. Um, the rate of development would be hours to days, and the mediators, mediators of injury, also known as the cells that have to do with this, is neutrophils, monocytes, and macrophages. I would think my sickness with the salmonella food poisoning would probably have to do with this because it was a um, it was a bacterial infection, so I would probably I would have fell into this um, classification. Examples of these symptoms would be rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and um, there is a skin test for this, and you would see erythema, which is redness and swelling, in three to eight hours. And then the last classification is type four delayed hypersensitivity. Um, the antigen to this, this is, these would be intracellular and, intracellular and extracellular. The rate of development is several days. And the cells that have to do with this is cytokines and T cytotoxic cells. Um, the examples of symptoms are contact dermatitis. And a good example for this is poison ivy. Um, another one is the tuberculin test. Um, and there's also a skin test for this, which is the TB test. Um, you would see redness and swelling in about 24 to 48 hours. And this is just another slide that so shows examples and shows you a little bit better visualization of the classifications, um, the four classifications. So type one, we have um, the causes of this are localized and systemic anaphylaxis. It can be caused by, again, seasonal allergies, hay fever, food allergies, um, shellfish, peanuts, hives, and eczema. Um, type two, this is more of the, the blood, you know, the blood transfusion type, the cytotoxic hypersensitivity. So red blood cells are destroyed by the antibody, um, typically during a transfusion reaction of mixed matched blood. Type three, this is more of like the inflammation. Um, so we have glomerulonephritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic lupus. And then type four is the most common cause of contact dermatitis. So here's the tuberculin reaction. Um, this was the poison ivy reaction. Um, so again, just some more examples of the different classification. So we're going to talk a little bit about anaphylaxis, and I know everyone's probably heard of this before, um, and this occurs when mediators are released systemically um, right into our whole body system. Um, so it can be like an injection of a medication, it can be a chemotherapy infusion, a bee sting, um, shellfish, and this can occur within minutes, um, very, very quickly. 
And the initial symptoms can be like swelling, itching at the site of exposure. Um, very, very life threatening, and this needs to be treated immediately. Um, the bad part about this is we get into bronchial constriction and airway obstruction. Um, so we really want to do everything we can to prevent that. Um, patients can even go into anaphylactic shock, and shock can occur rapidly. So you'll find patients with a weak, weak thready pulse. They'll get hypotension. They'll get short of breath. They'll have the dilated pupils and cyanosis, especially around the lip area. Um, so that's when um, anaphylactic shock occurs. Um, total vascular collapse will happen. They become hemodynamically unstable, um, and death will occur without emergency treatment. Um, you know, I think the only anaphylactic reaction I've really seen actually was an example of my husband. Um, it wasn't severe, um, but we were eating at um, a hibachi restaurant and um, not really a big seafood guy to begin with, but they did throw him some of that shrimp with a, like they typically do. And he decided to try shrimp that evening and pretty much minutes Within minutes, I want to say two minutes, um, he developed um, severe lip swelling, um, scratchiness in his throat. He felt like a little swelling in his throat, um, and he actually developed GI issues after that as well. So, I mean, we had time to go to the store and get Benadryl. Um, I mean, it could have been a lot worse, but just an example of a, um, a mild anaphylactic reaction. And this is just a good picture of how anaphylaxis affects our whole system. It's very systemic. So going top to bottom, we can have swelling of our eyes, um, definitely runny nose, um, like I talked about, swelling of the lips, tongue, and throat. We get into our vasculature and our heart. So typically we develop tachycardia. Um, I know it says slow heart right here, but tachycardic, tachycardia is typical and low blood pressure, especially if we're getting into more of the shocky type of anaphylaxis. Um, skin, the patient develops highs, hives, itchiness, and flushing. Um, pelvic pain, going back up to the top, we have central nervous systems. Um, we can, the patient can be lightheaded, they can lose consciousness, they can develop confusion, headache, and anxiety. Um, respiratory is a big one, um, so we know patients can get short of breath and develop the wheezing and strider, especially if they're having that bronchial constriction and airway closing. Um, hoarseness, pain with swallowing and cough. Um, GI is very typical, um, cramping, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and vomiting, and there can be loss of bladder control. And then just another slide. Um, that just shows you examples of what allergens can cause anaphylaxis. So food for some patients could be peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish is a big one as we just talked about, um, milk, eggs, fish, soy and wheat, um, venom. So we know definitely like um, bees, yellow jackets, wasps, fire ants and spiders. Um, latex is a big one and also really any type of medication. And it goes through all the symptoms, again, that we just talked about. And this talks about epi, so we need to recognize the severity right away and use epinephrine. Um, a lot of patients who have been tested for allergies, they'll typically get an epi pen and hopefully carry that around with them. Um, and they need to keep two um, epinephrine auto injectors on hand at all time, especially if they have a very severe allergy to bees. Um, that's very important to keep the epi with them. And this is just anaphylaxis emergency management. Um, so we need to look why, what happened? Why did this happen to the patient? Um, what was the exposure? Um, did they ingest something? Did they ingest shellfish? Did they inhale something? Did they get an in insect bite? Is the stinger still in the skin? Is this more topical? Um, and airway, airway, airway. So, so important, okay? If we don't maintain the patient's airway, we're going to have um, cardiac arrest, okay, and we won't be able to treat the patient. So airway is the first um, thing to go to. Um, IV access, okay, and epinephrine, okay. So just know that we need to give a dose of 0.3 to 0 0.5 milligrams IM, and that gets inject injected into the mid-outer thigh. Um, we can repeat that every 5 to 15 minutes as needed. 
So remember 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams. Um, albuterol updraft is also a big one, especially if the patient is having that strider and bronchospasms and wheezing. Benadryl IV, um, a steroid methylprednisolone IV. This is why we need that IV access. Um, it's really important to put the patient in a recumbent position and elevate the legs. So um, really the trunk of their body goes backwards and their legs come up. We lift the legs up. Um, and that is just to get all the blood flow to the vasculature and to around our heart, um, especially if they're going into anaphylactic shock and they're becoming hypotensive and hemodynamically unstable. Um, we want to make sure that we're getting as much blood flow to the heart as possible. Um, IV fluids, so normal saline bolus, one to two liters, and possible need for vasopressors. So nursing management, we want to reduce the exposure to the allergen, so we need to treat the symptoms, and we, we cannot let this allergen happen again. So we really need to know what the allergy is and make sure that this doesn't happen again to the patient, and again, treating the symptoms. Um, giving the patient oxygen therapy if needed, especially if there's a respiratory system involved, um, monitoring vital, vital signs. Um, medications that are very helpful for any allergic reaction or hypersensitivity reaction can be antihistamines, so Zyrtec, Benadryl, Hydroxazine, um, those are good examples of antihistamines, and these will help with like the allergic rhinitis, the hives, the itching, the edema. Corticosteroids are big ones, and it can be either solumedrol or methylprednisolone, and this helps a lot with inflammation. Um, antipyritics, so even lotion, especially if it's like a topical issue, there's hives, there's itching, um, there is calamine lotion for that, and the big one is epinephrine. So that's hypersensitivity reactions, and the next thing we're going to talk about is lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, so SLE. Um, this affects 1.5 million people in the U.S., um, and typically affects a lot of women. So for women, onset of some, some symptoms can worsen during like menses, pregnancy, and even using oral contraceptives. So they're thinking a big link to this is um, hormone related, um, and auto, so autoimmune hormone related. Um, it's very multifactorial in origin, so it's very systemic. Um, it can affect a lot of organs and a lot of body systems. It can typically affect the skin, uh, joints, our blood, renal, neurologic, our serous membranes, like our pleural, pleura and our pericardium. So which are, it's those fluid-filled sacs that really protect the heart and the lungs. Um, those get in, in, inflamed. Uh, patients go through alternating periods of remission and exacerbation, especially if a patient does have a stressful episode. Um, he kind of gets overworked, um, the body gets stressed, they typically go into a period of exacerbation. Again, cause is really unknown, but they definitely think there's a genetic influence and also, like I said, hormonal. Um, the sun plays a big part. Um, even if they go through a period of exacerbation, the sun can, can do that to a patient and also, like we talked about, stress. And viruses can stimulate immune hyperactivity. This is a good video on the pathophysiology of lupus. So I'm um, very highly recommended to please watch that. And then the signs and symptoms of lupus. So severity can differ based on the symptoms involved and also the progression of the disease. Um, the most commonly involved tissues, again, like we talked about, are the skin and the muscles, the lining of the lungs and the heart, um, also, the nervous t tissue and the kidneys. Um, a lot of general complaints from patients are fever, weight loss, joint pain, and excessive fatigue. Um, we're going to take a look at dermatologic problems. So a lot of skin issues, um, they typically have vascular skin lesions that can appear anywhere, but mostly in skin-exposed areas. Um, photosensitivity, so again, we're talking about sunlight and UV radiation.
Um, very typical is the butterfly rash, and we're gonna, I have a picture of that in a few slides, but this is, it almost looks like butterfly wings that kind of go over both cheeks and over the bridge of the nose. Um, nasal and oral ulcers are very common in hair loss. Uh, musculoskeletal, so these patients typically have severe joint pain and arthritis, um, swelling in the joints and muscles, and an increased risk for bone loss and fracture. And here is the examples of the butterfly rash. So it's that redness and it looks like kind of those butterfly wings that come across the cheeks and the bridge of the nose. Continuing on to car cardiopulmonary, um, these patients typically are um, have tachycardia as well as tachypnea. Um, a cough is more suggested of lung disease. So that means there's some inflammation of the lining of the, of the lungs. Dysrhythmias can be common, and that can be due to fibrosis of the arterioventicular nodes, and that's more in advanced diseases. Pericarditis, myocarditis, and endocarditis, all from inflammation. Um, hypertension, high cholesterol, um, and these patients typically have coagulation disorders, um, also known as antiphospholipid syndrome which causes clots in the arteries and the veins. So you'll know a lot of patients that have lupus tend to be on a blood thinner such as Coumadin. Moving on to renal, these patients typically have high protein in their urine and inflammation of the glomerulus. So they have glomerulonephritis and also scarring and damage can lead to end-stage renal disease. And if patients are typically more end-stage lupus, they may be having dialysis treatments. Um, the nervous system. These patients can have focal onset seizures, um, peripheral neuropathy, very common, uh, memory deficits and disordered thinking, as well as depression, mood disorders, and anxiety and headaches. Continued on to hematologic, um, there's a lot of formation of antibodies against blood cells, so their body is continuously fighting itself. Um, it's very typical for these patients to have anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia, and we did talk about, about coagulation disorders and increased risk for clots. Um, and also, they're very susceptible to infection, so there's increased susceptibility, impaired ability to eliminate bacteria from the body, and pneumonia is most common. Again, this is just a this is from your book, and this is just going on going about all the systemic symptoms that this patient can have. And I think we covered most of these. But it's this will be good to study. Take a second glance at this at this slide. So diagnosis of lupus. So there is going to be a presence of what is called antinuclear antibodies, also known as ANA. So in, these are present in about 97% of patients with lupus. So that's a really high percentage rate. And this is, a, this is from a blood, a blood draw. So they, there'll be an increase of antinuclear antibody. There really is no specific test for lupus, but the doctor will need to look at a variety of abnormalities in the blood since it's since, since such a multi-system disorder. There will also be an increase in what's known as um, erythro um, ESR and CRP, C-reactive protein. Um, these both indicate inflammation. They're definitely not a diagnostic tool, um, but we should be seeing an increase in the ESR and CRP. These also can be used to monitor dis the disease progression and also treatment effectiveness. So if the patient has been put on some sort of medication, they'll take a look at the ESR and CRP to see if the levels are going down a little bit to see if the medication is helping with inflammation. Typically, the provider will look at criteria, and four or more of this, these criteria need to be present for a diagnosis of lupus. So, of course, we'll see an, a presence of ANA, the antinuclear antibody. Um, is there a rash, raised patches, scaling, or lesions? anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia, uh, presence of an anti-DNA antibody, 
Is there a butterfly rash? Is there oral ulcers? Is there two or more joints that have arthritis or two or more joints that have severe joint pain? Is there any pleuritis or pericarditis? Or are we noticing any inflammation in the, in the pericardial lining or the um, pleural lining? Is there any seizures, psychosis? Is the patient having photosensitivity and there's high, is there high proteins in the, in the urine? So definitely doing a really good HMP is, is um, imperative for diagnosis. Again, we talked about antibodies, so that ANA, the anti-DNA, and the antiphospholipid. So these are all blood draws that we need to do. These will all be elevated. CBC, getting a UA, seeing if there's protein in the urine. Um, X-ray of affected joints. Um, also chest X-ray, we can see that, you know, if there's any inflammation going on in the heart and the lungs, and also is there cardiac involvement. So we can take a look at an EKG or an echocardiogram. Drug therapy for lupus. So NSAIDs are big, that's gonna help with inflammation, it helps with joint pain, arthritic pain and swelling. But of course, if we have you know any GI or renal involvement, we need to be careful with that. So monitor, um, monitor our renal functions. Anti-malarial agents are for lupus. So we have hydroxychloroquine and Plaquenil. Um, and this um, really helps with the reducing flare-ups and helps decrease inflammation. Um, it helps with fatigue, skin, and joint problems. It can possibly repress the immu immune system, but it should not cause immunosuppression. Um, the big thing with um, Plaquenil and hydrochloroquine as eye examination should be done every 6 to 12 months, and this is due to developing retinopathy. So that's a good thing to remember. Again, corticosteroids are a big one. This helps with, with inflammation, and it's a big uh, medication that helps with flare-ups, okay? So if a patient is going into an exacerbation, they may have to order some steroids for the patient. So the doses will be small, and they'll only be given for short periods. Also immunosuppressive drugs. So there's azithroprine and cyclophosphamide. Um, this can suppress the immune system and also prevent end, organs, end organ damage. Continued on with drug therapy, we have a steroid sparing drugs, also known as methotrexate. Um, also more immunosuppressive drugs, cyclosporine, Mycophenolate mofetil, also known as salsep, and azithroprine. Cytotoxic agents such as cyclophosphamide. Anticoagulants, because we do have an increased risk for clots, the patient can be on Coumadin. And there's B lymphocyte stimulators, Fenlista, and that inhibits inflammation. So nursing, what do we need to look at here? Um, HMP is definite. What is the patient exposed to? What are the patient's exposures? It would just be very interesting to find that out. Um, have they been around a lot of sun? Have they been a lot, around a lot of stress? What's their medication history? What's their family history? And what are we assessing for? Okay. So we're going to assess for fevers just because there's systemic inflammation going on. So the patient can have definite fevers. Um, periorbital edema is very common. Is there any weight loss going on? Do you notice any oral nasal ulcers? Photosensitivity? Is there joint pain and swelling? Fatigue, shortness of breath? Insomnia can be very common. Chest pain going on? That means that we would have some involvement of inflammation in the heart. Um, butterfly rash, lesions, and scaly lesions. Um, peripheral neuropathies are also very common. Uh, seizures, confusion, anxiety, and depression. We would hear that pleural friction rub, especially if we do have that inflammation in the pericardium and also the pleural, pleural cavity. Um, we might hear that pleural friction rub, pericardial rub, 
there'll be some decrease in breath sounds, um, hypertension, dysrhythmias. We might notice some Raynaud's, so we'd have that pallor or that um, almost that um, blue or even black look to the fingers is very typical of lupus and Raynaud's. High protein in the urine, Would do we have hair loss? Okay, so we went through a lot of the, the different systems again. I know you're getting probably sick of hearing all the uh, um, assessment findings, but really good to know. So nursing care during a disease flare. So we want to monitor fever patterns and treat that fever. We want to monitor any joint inflammation and treat that. So those NSAIDs can work, work both for that. Um, fatigue. Um, monitor the patient's weight. How's their fluid intake and output? Are they, how's their appetite? Getting 24-hour urine samples, looking for protein in the urine. Um, especially if the patient is on any anticoagulant such as Coumadin, we do want to observe for signs of bleeding. And we would definitely look for like any bruising, echematic areas in the skin, um, bleeding in the gums, bleeding in the urine. Uh, vision problems, headaches and seizure activities. So we want to monitor for that. Give emotional support, especially if a patient is going through a disease flare. It can be very, very frustrating. They get very ill. Um, so definitely emotional support. And these are some influ influencers on a disease flare. So we talked about increased fatigue and increased stress. Those are really the big ones. Um, sun exposure and infections, um, surgery and illness can bring on an exacerbation. We definitely want to educate on pain management strategies, hot and cold applications, NSAID use, um, conserving energy to prevent fatigue and also relaxation therapies. And that is it on lupus. And we're moving on to our last portion of this content, which is rheumatoid arthritis. <clears throat> so this rheumatoid arthritis is actually inflammation of the connective tissue in the synovial joints. Um, patients go through periods of remission and exacerbation. It's very similar to lupus as of what exacerbates the patient, so it can be um, stress and fatigue. Um, and this is one of the most disabling forms of arthritis. So incidence increases with age, and usually it tends to peak between 30 and 50. Um, the exact cause is unknown. Um, definitely genetics play a role from what they think and environmental triggers. So again, those antibodies, they may enter the body and then that second um, um, susceptibility to the antibody is that's when it gets triggered into the body. So definitely autoimmune. So again, we're gonna go over this. A susceptible person has the immune response to the antigen, okay? So the body has to actually have that antigen in their body at least once to be susceptible again, okay? So the antigen triggers formation of abnormal immunoglobulin, so that's IgG, okay? So whatever this antigen, it triggers IgG. And then we have autoantibodies, which are called rheumatoid factors. So rheumatoid factors combine with IgG, and these deposit on the synovial joints, okay? And that's where we get inflammation. So I hope that makes sense. Rheumatoid factors connect with IgG, and this distributes themselves on the synovial membranes, creating inflammation. So stressors can create flare-ups or they can start a disease even. So again, we have infection, work, stress, surgery, emotional upset. And signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so there may be specific joint involvement with pain, stiffness, limited motion, and signs of inflammation. Um, joint will be very warm to touch, swollen and tender. And typically joint symptoms will be um, symmetrical. Um, I know a lot of times if we're talking more about osteoarthritis, it may be um, unilateral or just on one side. Rheumatoid arthritis is typically um, both joints, so both elbows or both knees, they'll be symmetrical. The small joints of the hands and feet are most common, 
but wrists, elbows, shoulders, knees, hips, ankles, and jaws are also affected. The cervical spine can even be affected. Um, fingers can be developed to be spindle shaped just from the inflammation and the synovial hypertrophy. Um, joint pain will increase with activity and motion. Sometimes with arthritis, we find ourselves slow in the morning and then the pain gets better as we move around, but um, activity and motion will actually make the patient feel worse. Inflammation and fibrosis may eventually cause deformities and disabilities, and we'll get to that. Um, but onset of these symptoms at first are typically subtle. Um, they can be nonspecific. Um, some patients even develop like a fatigue and weight loss, generalized stiffness, and then it, it progresses more. Um, these are some examples of um, deformities that can be caused from rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so this top picture that's in white, the first one on the top shows a mallet finger. Um, it must be, you know, the inflammation in the joint is actually pushing that joint downward. Um, there's a boutonniere deformity, and then there's a swan neck deformity. And this other picture on top shows both. So this top one here is the boutonniere, and then the bottom, which is the pointer finger, is that swan neck. Um, this bottom picture is actually showing what's called an ulnar drift. So the fingers are actually kind of drifting away um, to the outer portion of the body. And just more examples of what deformity can look like with um, rheumatoid arthritis. So here's a picture of the thickened synovial membrane. Um, and the cartilage is actually degrading. Um, I do want you guys to know this. Um, there is what's called extra articular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid nodule, nodules are a big one, and they develop in about half of patients with RA. So these nodules actually form under the skin and they are very firm and non-tender. Um, they're usually um, formed on bony areas. So you'll see them on the fingers and the elbows of patients. Typically treatment isn't needed for these, but what we really need to look out for is that these nodules can break down just because they get so big, there's such a thin type of skin over the nodule. So there can be pressure injuries over these nodules that we really need to be careful for. Um, there is scleral nodules. So this can actually result in cataracts and vision loss. Um, so we really need to be careful of that. And then nodules can even appear in the heart and the lungs, which can cause pericarditis and pleural effusion as well as cardiomyopathy. More extra articular manifestations is Drogren syndrome. So this is actually um, inflammation of rheumatoid arthritis that can damage the tear producing glands, um, which make the eyes feel very gritty and dry. So we lose a lot of um, lubrication in the eye and patients can develop photosensitivity because of this. And the last extra articular manifestation is Felty syndrome which um, the patient will have an enlarged spleen and a low white blood cell count, and they will be at increased risk for infections and lymphoma. So diagnostics to RA. So the patient will have positive, remember we talked about rheumatoid factors, those are what attach to the IgG. So there will be an increase of rheumatoid factors and about 80% of patients with RA will have an increase in rheumatoid factors. Again, we talked about um, ESR and CRP. Um, these levels will both be elevated, again, due to inflammation. That is not one diagnostic factor, but we should look at this just to see that they are elevated. There will be an increase in the ANA titer, so anti-nuclear antibody, very similar to lupus. Um, a big one for this is synovial fluid analysis. So they'll actually um, aspirate some synovial fluid the fluid should be straw or cloudy colored with fibrin flex. Um, there also will be an enzyme positive, positive enzyme of MMP3 and also white blood cells in the fluid. There can be tissue biopsies to confirm in inflammation. Um, X-rays can show soft tissue swelling of the joint um, and also an HMP.
And this is actually diagnosis, diagnostic criteria for RA. Um, so we took a look at the involvement of the swollen and tender joints, okay? So it looks like greater than 10 joints, you'll get a, a, a scoring system of five. Looking at blood levels in serology, if we have one high positive titer on at least one test, we'll have a score of three. So this is looking at um, rheumatoid factors. Um, looking at the synovial fluid, inflammation of the synovial cavity. Um, they can tell, you know, I think definitely by doing an aspiration of the fluid, they can see if there's been any inflammation more than six weeks or less than six weeks. So that they'll get a score on that. And again, this is for more blood draws. So um, they're looking at CRP and ESR, um, and they'll get a score for that if that's elevated. So just remember, scoring higher than six is definite for RA. And this is just showing you the um, stages of rheumatoid arthritis. So over here on the left-hand side is a healthy knee joint, good synovial tissue, joint capsule, no inflammation really noted. And then we get into stage one, where we see synovial membrane swelling, a little bit of excess blood, and we could probably see a high white blood cell count if we do an aspiration of the fluid. Stage two, we have cartilage involvement and destruction of cartilage and also narrowing of the joint space. Stage three, we actually have a formation of a synovial panis and cartilage is actually erode, eroding with um, extensive cartilage loss. And then stage four is really end stage. And <laughs> what's really bad about this is actually there's there's nowhere, there's nothing to even be inflamed anymore. So all of our tissue and cartilage is gone. So that means inflammation subsides. It's really just bone on bone, um, total loss of joint function. And there's typically formation of nodules in these areas. Um, typically these patients in stage four um, have, will need um, arthroscopy, total joint replacements, even in stage three, they should probably look at that before it gets to the point where we totally lose any tissue. So drug therapy for um, RA. So we have something that's called DMARDS, disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And this slows the progression of the disease and it decreases risk for joint erosion and deformities. So an example of a DMARD is methotrexate and this is preferred in early treatment. Um, physicians like this, it's a lower risk for toxicity of the drug. It can cause bone marrow suppression and hepatotoxicity. Um, we need to do frequent CBCs and CHEMS with this drug, and the therapeutic effects um, usually take place within four to six weeks. Then we have sulfazazine and Plaquenil, and this is for mild to moderate disease, and it's actually rapidly absorbed and well tolerated, so another good drug to have. Um, the big thing with these is to drink adequate fluids. Um, typically, crystals can form in the urine, um, so we, we do not want that happening. Um, wearing sunscreen, the patient can develop photosensitivity and the skin can, you know, react to the sun if taking these medications. Um, and an eye exam, I remember we, ta remember we talked about why we need an eye exam every six to 12 months. Um, the patient can develop retinopathy when on this drug. Um, there's also, um, Leflunamide or Areva, and this blocks immune cell overproduction. And then there's Zelgans. I know you hear this a lot on commercials on the TV. And this is a Janus kinase inhibitor, uh, decreases inflammation, and this is more for moderate to severe RA. Then we have a biologic response modif modifiers or BRMs. And these are more for patients who have not responded to the DMADs. So this is kind of like a second line drug and it also can be used in combination. Combination or alone, depending on the provider's choice. So we have what are called TNF inhibitors. 
And there's um, Tenericept or Enbril. Um, this is a sub-Q injection. There's Humira. And both of these inhibit inflammation by blocking the tumor necrosis factor. So that is their job. That's what they do. So those are just the drugs I want you to know. I know there's a ton of them in the book, but the ones on the slides are what I want you to know. Um, there's surgical therapy as well. So this is actually, you know, just to relieve severe pain and try to improve function. Um, there's a synovectomy, so that's removal of the joint lining. And then a total joint replacement may be needed, especially if we're getting into, remember, we look, took a look at the third and fourth stage of RA. So nursing care, what can we do? So H and P, okay, getting that good physical. Um, are the joints symmetrical in inflammation and pain? Um, is there swelling? How's the range of motion? How's their general health status? Are they fatigued? Is there weight loss? How's their appetite? Um, have there been any precipitating stressors that could have caused an exacerbation or even caused this disease to form? We mentioned anorexia and weight loss. Is there fever? I mean, with severe inflammation, the patient can have fevers. Um, is there rheumatoid nodules forming? Is there murmurs or dysrhythmias? Okay, that can mean that there's inflammation going on with the heart. Um, pleural effusions. Um, remember we talked about having um, nodules forming in the heart and the lungs. That's when we would have the murmurs, the dysrhythmias, the pleural effusions. Splenomegaly, okay, why would that be? Remember that's one of those um, Felty syndrome we talked about. Um, drug therapy is most important. So giving the drug therapy as ordered, um, education on the drug therapy, especially if they need to wear sunscreen, do they need to drink a lot of fluids? Um, do they need to get those eye exams? Getting their pain assessment and treating their pain. Um, educate the patient, especially on the balance of rest and activity. Um, also, big collaboration collaboration with PTOT. Um, we want to maintain joints in the neutral position. Um, we want to use the strongest joint while doing tasks. And especially if we're distributing weight, we want to distribute, distribute it over multiple joints, not just stressing one. Um, trying to change positions often and avoiding repetitious movements. So case management and social work will also probably need to be involved, especially if the patient is starting to have to be debilitated and need a lot of help at home. Um, cold and heat therapy is a big one as well. 